Right. Yeah, well, it's a really good question. So the question is, Nietzsche said God is dead and he believed that things would fall apart as a consequence of that. And I'm claiming, for example, that people have an implicit religious structure and they act it out. Okay, so there's actually a lot of things happened as a consequence of the fact that that's a reasonable issue, a good question. So, one of the things you might think about is that so Nietzsche's claim and Dostoevsky's claim were quite straightforward. They said that once you took the foundation out of something, it would fall. Now, it might take a long time to fall, especially if it's a big thing. So, you know, you could make the claim, for example, that the Soviet Union basically fell in, like, 1970. But it took 19 years to topple over. Because it's a big thing, right? It's, it just doesn't crumble all at once. And so, Nietzsche and Dostoevsky's claim would be, once you hack out the basic assumptions, and question them, then it's only a matter of time until the entire structure decays. And you could think that perhaps, you know, if you have a habit, and then you become conscious of the habit, and you practice a new habit, then you can have a new habit. And so what that means is that you can use your conscious mind to restructure your implicit beliefs. It's hard. Or you can use your conscious mind to destroy your belief in the value of those implicit actions, and demolish them across time. Okay, so that could happen. And I think to some degree that has happened. It's certainly happened enough so that people are very confused about what they believe or even about what belief means. Because there's a contradiction between what people think and, there's a, and how they act. So, okay, that's one tangent, so to speak. Jung actually took that question very seriously in some sense, because Nietzsche... Here's the flaw in Nietzsche's argument. I think. It's like, I hesitate to ever say that, because, like I said, he was a staggering genius. So, but Nietzsche believed, his proposition was that once the religious edifice fell, that people would have to create their own values. So he believed that the overman, the superman, so to speak, would be a new type of human being, like an existential type of human being, who would be able to accept the fact that there was no ultimate meaning, but create their own values. Okay, but the weird thing about that is you don't actually seem to create values. That's, what, that's where Nietzsche is flawed, and I think that's where he implicitly accepted the presuppositions of the rationalists. Because if there's no real source of value, then it stands to reason that you create values. But you don't. Not easily. Like, you know, think about your own life, you know. So let's say you make a New Year's resolution, you say, well, I'm going to study, like, three hours a day. It's like you're trying to create your own value structure, right? But then you find out it's a lot harder than you think because you don't listen to yourself. It's like you wander off and, you know, play video games or watch something on YouTube, you know? And, and you know, why are you doing that? Well, it's because you're led by values. You don't create them. Now, maybe there's a co-creation, you know, because it's not like you can't change yourself at all. But we should be very careful before we jump to the conclusion that values are, or even can be, something that people actually create. Now, the phenomenologists, like Heidegger, and Jung as well, would say, no, no, let's, let's just not get too hasty about making the presupposition that we can or should create our own values. Now, one reason you might be hesitant to do that is that Hitler created his values, so to speak, and so did the Soviet communists and the North Koreans. You know, they're trying to impose a rationalist value structure on a society, and the consequences of that have been... You know, people debate about how many people died in the Soviet Union as a consequence of internal repression, and as the Marxist revisionists rally back to their original beliefs, the estimate keeps going down, but, you know, it was tens of millions of people. So, and in China, who knows, it was, maybe it was a hundred million people. It was a lot of people, and then, of course, there's the Nazis, and, you know, so, the, the, the act of in attempting to rationally construct a value system and then impose it, that doesn't seem to work out very well. So, you know, on a sociological level, we seem to have evidence that that's dangerous. And then on a personal level, it's like, yeah, you're so sure you create your values? I would say, to a large degree, you discover them. And so, you know, here, here's, 
here's an experiment you can try. One, I told you last week, I think, to try to watch yourself speak for, I think you should do it for the rest of your life. You know, because words are very, very, very powerful, and they lead you places, so you should be careful how you use them. But, like, here's another really interesting experiment, is watch what you're interested in. Try, don't try to control it so much, just see where it is, because, like, and the phenomenologists certainly made much of this, it's like, for them, like for Heidegger, value was something that manifested itself in the world, and attracted your attention. You know, it wasn't something you precisely created. Now, I believe you have a hand in creating it. We'll talk more about that later. Because you're not, you're not a deterministic entity precisely. So it's like you can participate in the construction of a value system. But, you know, you have to take your biological nature into mind, and you have to take your cultural nature into mind, and you have to take other people into mind. And so, you know, you have... You can vary the game, but I don't think you can really change the rules. That's a reasonable way of thinking about it. Now, what Jung did, in many ways, was he said, well, maybe we have to go back down into the deep symbolic substrata of the human psyche to find the origin place of the ideas that we used to hold as religious. It was a hypothesis in some sense. And so the psychoanalytic hypothesis is something like, it's the... It's the psychic substrata, the pre-linguistic psychic substrata that is the source of ritual, symbol, and religious ideas. And so that you can go back to the source, in a sense, to revitalize those ideas. And that strikes me as a wiser approach than the rational approach, which says you can just create your values. It's like, we tried that. It didn't work. It really didn't work. It was murderous. So, and then the, the alternative, the no value proposition is, well, then you're going to be nihilistic. And that's not, I think nihilism is a form of mental illness. It's a sociological, it, it, it's caused by sociological conditions, but fundamentally it's a mental illness.